Hi everyone and a warm welcome to Tomorrow's Tech Today, bringing you the latest in technology talent, transformational change, and of course, tech as a force for good. I'm your host, Professor Sally Eves, and today we're focusing in on cyber security and in many ways, the cost of insecurity, with a special focus on managed detection and response, or MDR. With monitor, defect, and defend, really our mantra for today, this really is a deep dive right across cyber attack risk escalation all supported by the latest findings from the BlackBerry Global Threat Intelligence Report, especially issues on software supply chain, talent gaps and cost pressures, plus all at a time where attackers are diversifying their tools in an attempt to bypass defensive controls. We'll also unpack the role of automation, trusted partnership, skills uplift, evaluation advice and cyber community knowledge sharing and the application of AI to help close the human skills gap, strengthen cyber resilience and reduce daily alert noise, or in other words, really helping organisations of any size to better nip cyber attacks in the bud. So to discuss all of the above, I'm delighted now to be joined by Kieran Hollio, Vice President UK and I and Emerging Markets at BlackBerry. And without further ado, a very warm welcome to the show, Kieran. Great to have you here. Thanks, Sally. Uh, thanks for having me. It's great to, great to be on the show. Are oh, fantastic, and perhaps a great way to start. I offer this expression, you know, the person behind the tag and getting to know them more. Perhaps you just give a little intro to yourself and your role at BlackBerry. Yeah, thanks. Um, so, um, what have I, I've been at BlackBerry now for for just uh, nearly two and a half years, and uh, prior to that, I spent about twenty years in in IT uh, as a whole. Um, and that's been in a number of different roles. So whether it be sort of infrastructure or uh, or from a uh, from sort of a managed service or service provider perspective, uh, and in the past sort of ten years working in uh, in cybersecurity. So um, it's been a I've, I've enjoyed um, the IT industry, the pace at which it moves, um, cybersecurity being an extra added bonus of the pace it moves there. But um, overall, it's been a good sort of 20, uh, 20 years in this industry. It's been very exciting. Oh, it's amazing. I love what you said there about the pace of change. It's something I always say, particularly when doing mentoring and activities like that and looking at people who may want to get into the industry. What an incredible place to make a difference with this dynamism of change. And I know we'll come back to that. I mean, really, the kind of the scope, the scale, the sophistication, also the, the coming together of bad actors in this space as well. So much to consider and so much change to get involved in. So absolutely a great, great starter to 10 there, I think. Um, and in terms of that, pray, again, perhaps kind of getting into the subject matter, perhaps you go kind of macro to micro and look at what has been changing in terms of the cybersecurity market at the moment. What are you seeing most as key drivers for change? Certainly one area that's fascinated me is the rising expectations and how that's leading to behavioural change as well. But so much to tackle there. Perhaps that'd be a great way to start us off. <laughs> to start us off with a very big question for sure. I think um, <laughs> I, I I have a slightly different perspective on stuff, and yeah, there's a, there's a fantastic pace of change across uh, across cybersecurity in the IT industry as a whole. I think society as a whole is is moving at a faster pace than we've perhaps seen uh, previously. But fundamentally, I, I I don't think that the challenges uh, that exist within cybersecurity have necessarily changed uh, in the past ten years. Um, I think the the biggest challenge that we have, um, sort of that we see in the market, is is the resources. Um, there, you know, in, I think in 2014, you know, uh, to today, the challenge has actually doubled. So a recent sort of DCMS or uh, digital cultural media support, should I say, um, you know, we we're talking about over um, 697,000 businesses having a cyber uh, security um, uh, skill shortage. That's 51% uh, of the UK organisation. So when when I came into cybersecurity in 2014, that was a smaller problem. Uh, today, it's a bit of a bigger problem. And um, whilst technology is helping uh, fill those gaps, um, those gaps still uh, still are, are still there, nonetheless. Uh, and that presents some significant challenges for us. Um, I also think that uh, it's not just about what we do, you know, to to keep ourselves safe in the cybersecurity world. It's what we do when things things go wrong when when you do get hit by a cyber attack and that that um that presents real challenges for organizations you know the same report mentions four in ten organizations not having the skills to be able to uh, respond to a cyber attack or incident should it happen and more importantly don't have the skills to be able to recover to become productive again so really really important so whilst 
um, whilst everything has moved on and and, uh, and and things have evolved, actually some of the resource elements that we've just talked about um, have actually got worse. Um, so I think there's there's a lot we can do in in in, in the organisations that we work in to to help um, um, you know all, uh, folks with with the challenges that we see on a day to day basis. Uh, but fundamentally, um, uh, you know, change is good, uh, but we do need more people to come in and help with these cyber challenges. Oh, I couldn't agree more. In fact, there was um, some policy updates and also a research update that came through from UK government only very recently. And that was very much drilling into that. And I think it was around a 50 percent mark saying about all UK businesses have, say, a basic cybersecurity gap. And then on more advanced perspectives around cybersecurity skills, it went to about 33 percent a third. Yeah. So really, really interesting. I think those figures were relatively static from the last two or three years as well. But it's such a key area. And I'd love to drill into that more. And also what we can do to kind of encourage more people in given this challenge but also this opportunity here you know it's such a dynamic space to be and these as you, as you said this talent gap's getting bigger but great place to get involved so I'd love to come back to that a little bit later on as well but such a good point there um, in terms of that I was also thinking one thing that's come through to me lately in terms of expectation and behavioral change is around consumer and employees in relation to cybersecurity, and part of that is not just about awareness; it's about the experience. So, for example, the tools you're using, making sure that they're kind of friction-free, they're reducing um, workload and burnout, reducing noise, that type of thing. I think there's been a an interesting uh, catalyst of change here, possibly partly catalyzed by COVID, but people are expecting that same level of kind of security in your pocket, so to speak, and that ease of use and friction-free, whether you're a consumer or an employee. That's an interesting area I've seen too. Oh, it's a massive area for sure. I think um, uh, um, we experience ourselves in our, in our daily lives. You know, I, I work in the cybersecurity industry and, um, you know, subconsciously my first, first thought about things is, is this secure? Um, uh, and then immediately say, well, you know, it's, it needs to have that uh, consumer look and feel to the way I'm uh, using and consuming the applications or, or, or whatever it is you're doing. You know, what's whilst not impacting the productivity that's that's the important thing what you know, there's, a, there's a real balance to be struck between you know the the consumerization of of what we do in work uh, and the productivity piece and um, I think it's more than ever important that we try and strike that balance uh, with the different generations now in the workforce because you know we do expect a, a more consumer feel to the way that we that we go about our work but also um, because of that digital transformation we've been through in the past 10, 15, 20 years, the work that we're doing is more and more um, dependent on the security based in the cybersecurity world. So I think there's a real balance that organizations um, need to need to get to. Uh, and and that is, that's tough. And, and, and during COVID, there were some fantastic efforts across the globe um, to really enable people to continue working and be productive. And, 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 and you know, hats off to everyone that was involved on that. As we now come back to a new sort of normal, and a, a, whether it's a hybrid or back to the office for a couple of three days, whatever it is, that, that balance still needs to be struck. And um, we need to maybe need to rebalance some of those principles whilst, whilst we try and keep organisations secure. Absolute great points there. Thank you so much. And in terms of drilling into more of these whys and particularly kind of our main subject area today in terms of managed detection and response, I'd love to explore more here to kind of what is compelling organisations of all sizes really to turn towards MDR solutions if they haven't already. And one of the things that fascinated me looking into this more is some of the details from your global threat intelligence report. Really interesting there. So some of the things around kind of tool diversification from bad actors also the rise in cyber attacks against government and public service organizations uh, could go on but really interesting examples there but of course talent the cost of security etc as well or the cost of insecurity even um, i'd love to drill into a few of those factors there what are you experiencing in terms of this rise the why for managed detection and response yeah your, your point around the insecurity piece is is, is really important i think we're, we're now seeing the advent of almost daily um, almost daily, you know, cyber attacks being reported in the news, and, and that ability to, you know, remain secure and keep your organisation functioning on a day-to-day -day basis is becoming ever more challenging in in in, in the world we face today. You know, the threat re the threat report, Blackberry threat report, talks about the diversification of tools that threat actors are using, uh, and it is. Um, <sighs> 
it's really difficult for organizations to keep on top of this stuff. You know, we talked about at the top of the top of this intro here about the pace of change that we see in the in the industry. You know, the pace of change that we see in cybersecurity is rapid. It is, you know, daily, if not minutely, sometimes, right? So the ability for organizations to remain secure is becoming more challenging. I kind of describe it as a bit of a race. Um, you know, it's a race to remain secure because uh, fundamentally, we kind of maybe used to be in a bit of a marathon. I think now we're with the advent of AI, we're absolutely in a sprint. Um, and it's really important that organizations focus on what they're good at. And, and, and that's where we see the rise of MDR. Now, what, what organizations don't want to do is fall into the trap of trying to become a cybersecurity organization. Uh, they want to they want to do what they're good at doing, whether it's you know producing widgets or cars or airplanes or or providing services, <clears throat> whatever it may be. That is the core function and, and productivity output of that of that organisation. What we can't do is turn them into cybersecurity experts that have all the tools and all the threat intelligence and all the knowledge to be able to react on a on a on a daily basis um, to to everything that's coming at them. So. The reason that MDR has, has, has risen to sort of the top of uh, top of everyone's minds in some respects is is you want an expert to deal with the problem. You know, there are a lot of organizations, including BlackBerry in, in the market, that are experts in dealing uh, with uh, with cyber attacks. And the managed detection response piece is, a, is effectively an outcome of, of that, whereby we take away um, uh, not the responsibility, but we take away the accountability and deliver that as a service to organizations. They're then able to get their teams uh, and their, their their staff to focus on the, the, what they're good at and what they should be doing, which is business productivity in their in their particular area of focus. So give us the problem, we'll deal with the problem for you. Uh, and you know that doesn't mean to say that you're, you're completely standoffish. We need to be able to feed into the senior management within organisations to, to, to give them the intelligence so that they can make the right investment decisions uh, based on, on cybersecurity and other areas to keep themselves secure. But fundamentally, you know, the managed detection response is about uh, effectively outsourcing. Um, that piece from your organization, it, you know, allowing your teams and your staff to concentrate on what they should be doing, which is business productivity. Absolutely. I love that in terms of the partnership you're, you're bringing to the fore through doing that. And great example about that marathon and sprint. I really like that analogy. I think I remember rightly, it's about 11.5 attacks per minute that yeah. you, you found from your recent research in terms of threat actors. And I think that really does bring that to the fore. And the other thing that's stuck in my mind when you're talking about the sprint is also other considerations that we need to bring to bear around this. For example, you know, the right change management approach to support this as well. So when you're bringing in AI, you're having that sprint type of approach. Approach, for example, things like uh, CICD or continuous integration, continuous yep. deployment really rises to the fore to support that. And actually, those more regular incremental changes typically reduce risk. They don't increase it. So it can just brings to the fore so many holistic elements that have to come together for this, isn't it? Across technology, culture, skills, all these different elements, but process too. Yeah, exactly, Sally. And all of those things uh, you just said are spot on. I think the, the complexity that we see in the environments that we work in means that some of those things just aren't aren't capable of being done. You know, we would all love a greenfield site where, you know, we can implement brand new technology, all shiny and lovely and, you know, racked lovely. But a lot of customers are struggling with legacy infrastructure, legacy um, software, which means that, you know, a, a simple change can impact their operating. So I think when we when we talk to our customers, this is a journey and it's it really is a partnership about taking them on a journey from a uh, effectively understanding their security maturity uh, their appetite for risk because you know there is there, there are risks in everything we do and you have to manage those but when we talk to our customers it's like you know where are you now you know and where do you want to get to and and, and we help them get uh, to that security and maturity that they that they want to achieve by, you know, whether it be people, process, or technology, they're the three. They're the three sort of pillars that we talk to our customers about. Um, the process piece is um, is really important, making sure you know you've got the right change control, the right governance in place to do that, because. You know, we, we quite often see a change that is made, you know, exposes uh, organizations to increased risk and um, uh, fundamentally putting the right change processes in place you know, should should capture that. Um, but the people piece is, is becoming ever more prevalent. I think we saw yesterday the insider threat from uh, from Tesla, right? There's 75,000 yes. people. 
Um, that's in, that's incredibly unfortunate. And I feel for, feel for those that have had their details shared. Um, that that shouldn't happen. And um, you know where where the three people process and technology come together, it should have absolutely been it been prevented from happening in the first place. So. There's a lot to uncover in all of these organisations, and um, uh, you know the complexity uh, of some of the organisations mean that you know they're not able to be as agile uh, or as flexible as they could be to to put the right technology, all the process, all the people in place to to, to get to where they need to be. So, so they need organisations like Bradley to help augment uh, that that thinking and that and that and that sort of technology stack, so that we can we can do some of the stuff that they they can't do themselves. Absolutely. And again, love the points there. What you said there about regulation and compliance, immediately one of the things that popped into my head there was some of the software regulations that are changing, for example, as well. And some yeah. of your work around software supply chain and working with organizations there, for example, kind of from, from the code up, you know, how BlackBerry is working with organizations there from the source code uh, level, which I think is massively important too. And it's all these different kind of complementary partnerships help to really um, leverage all that collective talent experience knowledge skills everything coming together it's got to be the way forward particularly with the, with dynamism dynam, dynam, even sorry of the, of the threat vectors that we're seeing here plus the talent shortages plus other pressures as well and you know, i mentioned earlier on about the cost of insecurity you talked there about that personal impact you know with the tesla example we've seen quite yeah. a few in, in healthcare recently as well and it affects you know i don't think there's anybody we know that you know on a personal level either ourselves or family friends etc have not been affected by something like that and yep. so you have that personal impact particularly with the most sensitive information like financial or, or healthcare, etc. Um, but also there's different forms of, of risk here too. So there's that breach of relationship between the organisation, the consumer, different stakeholder partners, etc. And there's also financial costs too. And I read one of your case studies around Capita, and that was a fascinating one because, again, actually that, that, that cost just went up and up. Uh, and that was an example around local council. And I think it fits into your recent research too about the rise of kind of public sector threats. But military and NHS, and I think the incident was um, anticipated to be around 15 to 20 million in terms of the ultimate cost. Already that's gone to 20 to 25. So again, in so many areas, this cost of insecurity just comes to the fore. Yeah, a hundred, you know, a hundred percent. I like I like what you said about the breach of trust piece. I think that's really, really important. You know, we in order to make relationships, we need we need to be credible. We need to maintain that trust. Um, I think when organisations um, are used as a, effectively a, a, an insertion point for, for bad actors and then they haven't done necessarily the supply chain uh, due diligence they needed to to ensure that you know the suppliers or whatever are, are, are cyber fit you know that really does impact the industry as a whole because um, I, I, I do not think anybody or any CEO or any leader in this industry wakes up and says today I'm going to be insecure I, it just doesn't happen but I, what I do think it happens is that we we maybe become a little bit complacent and we we get distracted on other things um, the source code up um, uh, work that we've done and are continue to do I don't think it's ever finished is incredibly important so we're able to we sort of stop the, the kill chain a lot earlier, even before maybe it comes to market, right? So we can we are able to take um, take more um, threat vectors out of the market uh, for for bad actors, and there'll be less for them to exploit. So I think that's really important. I do think that um, you know when we talk about supply chain security, that's going to become going to become more and more prevalent um, as um, as the regulation changes and and. And not just regulation, but responsibility and accountability changes for for, for those organisations because of that regulation change. If that makes sense, Absolutely. so you you have to be able to then certify that your entire supply chain is is you know cyber safe or not just cyber. There are other things. You know, um, you know, uh, we talk about carbon neutrality and uh, the twenty fifty goals, etc. All of that comes to, to to play. And and if you're a managed service provider, you must ensure that everybody that you're working with um, is 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 up to standard. Um, and and I think it's 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 a tough challenge. We talked about maturity of organisations. I think every every organisation is probably slightly different to the others. Uh, and therefore, that creates some integration complexities. Maybe um, some of those are simple to solve. Some of those are incredibly difficult. But one thing we talked about, or we haven't quite talked about yet, is culture. I think in ensuring that you are partnering with organisations that share a similar culture to you is is very important. Because 
um, the the ability for organisations to react and respond to things is is in my experience driven out of a culture. The ability to just say yes, let's get our feet uh, on the ground, let's get our hands dirty, and worry about contracting later. Right, BlackBerry is um, one of our best kept secrets is of our is our instant response capabilities. You know we. Uh, we do um, get land our feet uh, and then get hands on as quickly as we possibly can, and we worry about contracting later uh, in most, um, you know, in most organisations because it, by the time you you would get through a contract negotiation or some pricing or whatever it may be, hey, look, you, you know, you're a week down the line. Instant response is about recovery. Uh, it's, well, it's about stopping the incident from happening, understanding why it's happened, but then recovering back to to a place where you can be productive as an organisation. So that culture um, should permeate across the relationships and partnerships you have as an organization. And you know, BlackBerry works really hard with, uh, with, with our customers and our partners to, to ensure that we, we share the same common goals and, and a mission statement when it comes to cybersecurity. Absolutely. I think that's really important. I think also reflects in other areas as well about, for example, knowledge sharing, skills uplift. And another thing I think with culture is, for example, ensuring uh, data literacy. Obviously, security is part of that, but probably data literacy more broadly. Skills around this are available for everyone within organisations, not just strictly tech facing roles, because it really is that we talk about shared responsibility culture, don't we? But if we don't have that shared understanding and that confidence, you know, for example, sometimes you see access to training, but maybe it would just be one a year it has to be that kind of always on approach but also that helps people not just get skills confidence about what potential risk might be but the opportunity to experience that you know for example simulated risks um, and you learn from that and it's not in a blame way it's all about learning through do- doing it. it's that experience of what a threat instance looks like give me the confidence to apply those skills but also to kind of to put your hand up if you see something and have yeah. the confidence to raise it and know that do you know what say, say it isn't a risk actually yeah. but you did the right thing doing that no one's going to come down on you you were doing you know empowering people to speak up is so important too yeah i think i think the the government uh the ncsc um specifically have done some fantastic work about um upskilling uh the general public as a whole um and what i mean by that is you know starting uh starting an education process to to the wider um uh, general public to say you know, this is what cybersecurity is. This is what it means to you. This is what it means to your organisations where you work. This is what it means to your children. This is what it means to uh, to schools and hospitals and, and infrastructure within uh, within the UK. Um, and and that that work is really important, as we've just mentioned, because I think it, it, it lifts everyone's skill level up one notch or two or three, whatever the, whatever measure you want to put in place. Um, but it creates an awareness that, you know, should I really click on that link or should I really respond to that email or should I really do X, Y, Z on my, on my home PC? That then bleeds into the, the, the attitude that, that those individuals may take into, into work, whereby they are going to consider their actions um, um, before they press a button. And um, that sort of um, kind of whistleblower uh, moment where they where they think, oh, well, that looks a bit nefarious, or that looks a bit, you know, dodgy. Should I click on that link or not? And 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 they, you know, they 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 send it to to the cybersecurity center and say, is this is this good or bad? And they say, actually, it was fine to click on. That the you're right. That is the, absolutely the right thing to do, and we should applaud that behavior, not um, not criticize it in any way, because that is the sort of thing that. That does bring down organisations, unfortunately, and um, you know I think more more organisations. Um, I, I say more. I think a lot do a, a fantastic job uh, uh, educating um, their their teams and their staff about how they should operate within a within a within their environments and be be cyber safe. Um, I think we could always do more um i'm a i'm a keen advocate of education i think you know we should do a lot more at school uh running cyber security awareness sessions yes. and, and maybe maybe a bit deeper than we actually go now right because um certainly you know uh, my generation um i we didn't have, we just about had mobile phones now we've everyone's got an iphone i'm not saying that i've got a skills gap because uh, but but luckily i work in cyber security so i shouldn't but I think as as the digital native um, uh, you know generation come through, they are they they're glued to their devices, right? And you know we need to make sure that they have a deeper understanding. I would argue than perhaps we did, um, because 
I, th I think access to technology is is more prevalent now. I think the access to, or the ability to make um, errors is certainly higher when you're when you're when you're on uh, on devices now. So, you know, maybe we go a little bit deeper uh, than we have done previously in those sessions in schools to to give that education uh, and really get it ingrained from from an early age that um, they need to be uh, aware of their actions. I totally agree. There's so many different ways across security and privacy, uh, frankly, as well. Um, and there's some really interesting projects in this space at the moment. You, you've got me really excited talking about this because I think it's such a need and such an opportunity. So there's some things happening at the moment using kind of gamification and yeah. kids being involved in, in kind of simulating attacks, but also kind of getting really creative about what, be, what kind of being involved in cybersecurity actually looks like and using games to develop, um, you know, opportunities around this. So I'd love to come back on this because there, there's something there's something really interesting afoot on this very subject. And, and I think the timeliness is so important too because you know other things that are happening at the moment you know we've got this age of convergence around different technologies but on the ai side of things when we look at the sophistication you know things around deep fakes for example again yeah. secure giving kids the, the power to make informed choices i think we have to go earlier and earlier because of everything you just said it's, it's so it's so so important but develop the right kind of narrative to approach kids about this as well and so there's something really interesting there that, that's kind of going into the gaming field that i think hopefully um, will help that but there's other opportunities around this too because again that power of the narrative i think matters if it's introduced to in schools as, as this kind of big scary monster frankly or, or really complicated or it's something that kind of only mum and dad is telling you that you mustn't do this you mustn't do this be careful of that sometimes yeah. that you have the opposite effect so make it into something that you know you're, you're solving the bug challenge you're doing this you're really kind of empowered and enjoying that it's a different kind of approach to learning about security so I'd, yeah i'd love to come back on that because there, there's something happening right now that, that, that kind of fits into exactly what you were saying there Karen. yeah i think it's 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 how we talk about this stuff um you know i think i will i I am sure we're going to talk about AI in in a little bit of detail at some point on on this podcast um, because because it is, it is it is here it's happening it is now right but it but as I as I talk to customers and I talk to to colleagues and I talk to friends you know that aren't necessarily connected to the IT world and you talk about AI I, you know you can ask you can ask them what AI is and you get ten different answers yes um, and I think the breaking down and, and I, I'm I'm not claiming to be an expert by any uh, stretch of imagination, Sally, because uh, I, I quite often get proved wrong. Um, but fundamentally, I think it's the way that we talk about um, uh, these 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 new and emerging technologies that's that's the important piece. The technology is, is, is one element of it, but how do we break it down into a set of common languages um, that aren't IT speak, <laughs> that are common, common vernacular that, that everyone is going to understand? Um, and that's how we get the message across in schools. Now, for those that want to come into cybersecurity, please, 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 please come into cybersecurity. It is a rewarding and fulfilling career um, that is um, that is, uh, and, and at the moment, an exceptional place to be. Moving at such a pace um, that um, that we need we need people to come in. We talked at the top of the podcast around the, the gap that we have, right? I, I, and I think we need people coming in that have that have the right skill sets to to um, uh, to come and help us solve these challenges. It's, it's a very rewarding career. But but we've got to do a better job earlier in in um, and I think I think we are um, and I say we the, the, the sort of plural we um, I think there's always more that we could do but I think we're doing a good job of getting into uh, schools and universities and colleges to to put cyber front and centre of of a career choice I mean it never used to be a career choice it was always you're going to go into IT and you know kind of sit at the back of the sit at the back of the office and you know do some do some things that no one really understood it was a sort of a dark art if you like now cyber and it is front and center of day-to-day -day activities it is absolutely at the forefront of of what organizations are considering in the, in in the way they move to you know their, their digital world and gaming is one piece of that for sure um uh, and i think i'm looking forward to you know a few a few games that are going to come out on um on a, on a platform in september you know they they're going to change the way that people interact with um uh, with the world but they they've done a very good job of of articulating um uh what it is they do by using a very simple common language and and i think we do a bad job in this industry sometimes of of confusing the issue we don't we don't we don't um, we don't necessarily use 
a frame or, or a, a set of terms that people would understand. We like to make it, you know, all you know, complicated and highfalutin. Actually, let's let's explain to people what AI is. What are the different types of AI? Why are they different? And what do they deliver? What are the outcomes they're going to do? Um, and I think that's that's part of the you know, go go earlier into schools so that we can get um, we can get some really smart people um, trained up so that we can help with the cybersecurity problems of tomorrow. I couldn't agree more strongly. Absolutely love that and echo everything you've said. And and you mentioned AI there. Do you know what? Let's 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 pivot there now. I love, there's another area to come back to, but but I, I think we're in the zone for AI there. And you mentioned a great point on on the back there about explainability. Absolutely key. You know, if we're, if we're moving from being more transparent to being accountable, this explainability and and tailoring it to different audiences as well. I think is absolutely key. So love what you said about that. Um, and in terms of AI more broadly and particularly in the cybersecurity space. I'd love to kind of get your take on where we are now and how this is evolving, maybe in a relatively short time frame, given that kind of the scale that we were talking about, the speed of change. But I'd love to drill into that because, again, we were talking about the skills gap. I think AI has a huge um, role to play in helping to support that, but also more broadly around strengthening cyber resilience and, and reducing things that take away um, opportunities to, to identify threats, frankly. So, for example, mm-hmm. you know, operational overload, alert fatigue, you know, some of the sprawl incidents that we see that add complexity, AI can be a fantastic partner there to kind of level that up and reduce that overwork and, you know, kind of enable that higher order kind of work for, for, for people, if you see what I mean. So I think key role there to to really kind of a nip, nip attacks in the bud, so to speak. So I'd, I'd love to kind of drill into that from both a kind of prescriptive and predictive AI point of view. Yeah, I mean, the, the second point, the predictive AI piece is, is I think, how uh, BlackBerry and it is, is differentiating itself. Um, if I go back a step, you know, AI is, as I said, we, it, it's, it's prevalent now. Every time you turn the news on, there's someone talking about AI. Um, and, and that's fantastic because, you know, the, the more we talk about it, the more understanding gets out into, into the wider world. And um, the perhaps, perhaps more understanding means that um, uh, people become a little bit more um cognizant of the things like deep fakes for example and i think that's that's important but you know ai isn't isn't hasn't just popped up it's been around for 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 quite a long time and you know blackberry um have uh, were were the pioneers if you like of um of our ai for good um as we call it from a cybersecurity perspective and and we've just released um about three or four weeks ago our next generation ai so that's probably what eighth generation i believe it is of ai and, and it's an iterative um uh, ai engine that that has learnt um a huge amount in the past sort of 10 years that's enabled us to to really hone in on um, how we can uh, protect organizations and, and, up, and effectively keep them safe from tomorrow's threats. And I say tomorrow's threats because it's because that's what we do. Um, the, the model that we use and the engine that we use is so powerful that, um, that we c- really can predict uh, what is going to happen um, tomorrow and in the future based on some of the, uh, some of the really smart stuff that the, the engine does. So our, our, our <clears throat> Our message is slightly different. You know, we talk about MDR detection and response. Um, and Sally, you absolutely highlighted one of the biggest issues facing organizations, which is, you know, um, alert overload or event overload. You know, with, we talked about the resources and the lack of resources. We've talked about the fact that if they get deluged with stuff, then, you know, things are going to get missed. And, and those two things really do create the perfect storm for attackers uh, and, and, um, and threat actors to, to get in and, and cause disruption in, in, um, in, in customers and organizations. For us, we have a different um, take on this is prevent as much as you can. So prevention is better than cure, if you like. So we do a huge amount of work about um, how do we identify, how do we take an executable or a file, whatever it may be, uh, through a process that identifies uh, using AI um, that we really don't like the look of that uh, and then prevent it from executing. Right, so we do a fantastic job of, of preventing um, stuff happening. We're probably, you know, industry leading in what we do using AI to do that. Then we can get onto the detection response piece, um, which effectively means that the pull through. Once you prevent it as much as you can, there's always going to be, you know, things that that do come through. You can then detect and respond to the really important stuff. 
that is um, that is properly dangerous for your organisation and your environment, and and that that lessens the noise in 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 the sock. It lessens the workload of the resources and the scarce resources you've got, uh, and really allows them to focus in on 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 what is important to your organisation and, and what those risks are. So AI is a force for good um, in that sense. Um, it clearly can be a force for for, for bad as well. Um, you know, there's a yin and a yang to this sort of stuff. So our job really is to make sure that when we introduce the next generation AI engine, we're really upping the game um, with uh, with what we're doing and proving that the predictive solution can help organizations save time, money and effort and resources and all that sort of stuff. Um, but I, I, I actually, I, I kind of, I'm, I, there was a there's a, a conversation I was having the other day just around how do we regulate it right um, how do we regulate um, AI and it's a really difficult topic to discuss because it's you know, we talked about pace of change AI by its very nature is changing at such a rapid pace by the time governments of the world have regulated it you know we'll, we'll have regulation that's already a year out of date so I really do welcome the the, the government. Um, uh, of the UK hosting the first AI summit in the autumn. I think that's that's incredibly important uh, summit that will hopefully baseline uh, what we just talked about. What is AI? What is good? What is bad? What do we need to talk about? And what do we need to to look at? Um, how we can get some sort of rapidly evolving uh, regulation, for want of a better word, to wrap around AI as a as a, as a whole. But um, I, I think it's a topic that uh, will run and run. Um, uh, but it's incredibly exciting time. Uh, there's huge amounts of benefits to be had uh, with the advent of AI as a technology, whether it be healthcare or security or um, or policing. I think I, I read somewhere today that the police are using AI to to catch people on their phones, etc. Good or bad, whether we think that's good or bad, but you know, fundamentally, AI is uh, is here to stay, and we we need to make sure that um, uh, we are. Um, where we're cognizant of the of the threats and the, and the issues that it, that it may face, and then regulate um, where necessary. Absolutely, I love that. In fact, I read recently about um, GDEX, uh, the big courier uh, service organisation, and they were telling me about their experiences of, of using ethical hacking. Yeah. Um, and it was a really interesting example about delivery um, of the actualization of security support. And what really kind of struck me from this particular example was not just the, the use of AI and the difference that made, but also how it's supporting organizations to do more with what you have, which, again, in terms of kind of the themes of the moment, is very, very impactful. And not just for, say, larger organizations like the GDEX of the world, but for smaller organizations, too, that ability to do more and have that support, I think, is absolutely critical. And from the AI side point, of view another area that's really interested me is is how this is overcoming areas which aren't quite good enough maybe anymore you know from a security based approach say signature based protection for example there are still issues there and and we've seen quite a lot of examples of malware kind of still staying in a machine even after being identified like that so again another reason why we need ai machine learning to go on that journey from prevention detection and response you were talking about just now i think is absolutely critical Hundred, I get. You know, I think we will see in the next eighteen months. Um, you know, uh, a lot of change and a, a lot of um, a, a lot of good and bad stuff coming with AI. Our, our entire mission really is, um, and I think when we look at, we talked about legacy environments and legacy infrastructure and legacy software. You know, the old traditional sort of signature based, um, you know, needed to be updated every day, sort of cyber security um, antivirus um, uh, software just is not going to cut it into t- today's AI world. Um, and, you know, organizations that are still still sort of running those um, older technologies do really need to consider the impact of, um, of what AI is going to bring to them. It is, it is here to stay, um, you know, and, and you know, the, the threat actors do have access to, to AI as well, and I'm sure they're going to get more and more sophisticated with the use of it. So, you know, the message from us really is if you're going to, if you're going to do anything, fight AI with AI. Um, that's the only way you're going to win. You're not going to win with, uh, with data and legacy technology. You need to have technology of today um, that we know will prevent um, the AI threats of tomorrow. 
Almost sounds like the podcast title there, Kira. I ought to record that as a separate one tomorrow's tech today. Absolutely. I love that. Thank you. That's brilliant stuff. And honestly, if you put like, something else um, there that you, you were talking about in terms of other areas in this discussion as well. And one thing that's really struck me in, is the power of education around this. So we've talked about all these different challenges and, and, and how to kind of address some of these in many different areas from technology to culture to, to process to skills, etc. too. Another area is is how we come together. And you really brought that to the fore there, talking about the bad guys, basically, and like fighting AI with AI. But also we're seeing more and more bad actors collaborate. They're also, say, reimagining older threats, like Emotet would be perhaps an example of that as well. Yeah. Um, but even kind of this integration, say, on a- IT and OT environments, for example, moving from malware to actual physical threats against employees and horrible naming around that. But we're even seeing that at the moment too. So all these different things coming together to, to combat that, we need, the good guys to come together and part of that is knowledge sharing i think it's the threat intelligence it's that mutual support across the industry and across different verticals as well and that's something that has super impressed me and one of the areas perhaps we haven't covered it might be a great way to kind of bring this to a close is when people are out there looking for support there can be a lot out there can't they kind of cutting through, cutting through all the noise here that, that, that we see so what would you recommend people to look at you know whether you're a security practitioner or, or maybe someone in a home looking for additional support too there's some great guys out out there I, I've certainly seen but I'd love to maybe just speak about that what should people be looking out for you know how, you've mentioned some great ways about how Blackberry is differentiated there which is fantastic but I think education really is power and perhaps we could kind of focus on that area how can we support people you know evaluate and, and support their informed decision making basically yeah I, that's um that's a great question it's very open-ended as well and I, um, because it's, it's kind of everyone is going to be different um and I think uh, my, my first piece of advice was really is you know, understand what it is you're trying to achieve, whether it's a, as an individual or as an organization, be very clear about what you, what it is you want to achieve. Um, it's a very crowded market. There is a lot, a lot of, um, a lot of fantastic technology keeping people safe across the board. Um, you know, BlackBerry happens to be one of the, one of the best at doing it, but, um, I, I think there's a lot of, a lot of cool technology out there. Um, so number one is be clear about what it is you're, you're trying to achieve. <clears throat> number two for me is, um, you know, you've got you've got to understand sort of the culture. We talked about it earlier. The culture, especially as a as a, as a large organization or as a maybe even as, as a as a startup, you know, what is the culture of the companies that you want to uh, engage with? You know, we talked about instant response. You know, are you able to pick up the phone and talk to someone immediately and, and get a response if your uh, if your uh, if your organisation is attacked? So, culture and the ability to be reactive when you need help is one. And then, thirdly, um, it's a tough one because there's lots of there's lots of reviews out there, and there's lots of you know whether it be Gartner, Sam's, IDC. You know, there's a whole bunch of plethora of of different reviews and technologies. Um, Speak, speak to your peers, uh, speak to people. Um, what do they use? How, how have they found the experience? Um, how have they, have they, have they been vulnerable in any way? Have they been protected? Um, well, how does it work in their environment? And, and, and rather than get down to a technical tools level, you know, this is, they should have these features and benefits. I think often once you identify what it is you're trying to achieve, you understand the culture of the organization you want to work with, and then you speak to your peers, colleagues, friends about uh, what it is their experience of things, then I think it becomes really clear in the market where where you should spend your time and effort to to evaluate um, different different um, different companies and technologies. Um, it, there's a lot of, as I say, there's a lot of technology out there, um, and we've talked about how confusing sometimes it can be. Um, and how the technical terms and the three-letter acronyms that we love to use in, in, in IT can confuse. But by seeking counsel from, um, uh, from friends, colleagues, and, and uh, other organizations, being clear about your cultural um, aspirations and, and being clear about what you need uh, to achieve as your outcomes, I think that will that'll put you in a really good position to make some right decisions. Um, that said, um, you know, if you're considering it, be quick. Um, uh, you know, if you're in a position where you're unprotected or you've got vulnerabilities, 
please act quickly. Um, you know, really do make sure that you're protecting yourself and your organization, whether it be your loved ones at home or, or, or your colleagues and friends at work. You know, it is really important that if you identify vulnerabilities that you act quickly um, to make sure they're closed so that you continue to be, you know, a productive and asset to, to you, sort of UK PLC, if you like. Does that answer the question? I mean, it's kind of, I don't want to really get into the features and benefits piece because we could we could do speeds and feeds all day. But for me, they're, they're, they're a good sort of three benchmarks of how we as an organisation operate. Absolutely. No, three pillars. I often talk in pillars and it's perfect. Honestly, I, I couldn't agree more. And you mentioned there about SANS. Totally recommend the video that's, that's on your website there as well. It's about an hour long. And one of the things I like there is the focus on responsibilities from both vendor and client side. Exactly. So that clarity you were talking about and some of the things to ask I thought was excellent. But also things about metrics, for example, too, which I love. And then more broadly, things that certainly stand out for me and that I look for is that kind of quality of collective knowledge sharing and making that available for people, again, to support and, and you know, bring things out there. So some of the work you recently did around, say, the Cuba ransomware threat, for example, I thought was excellent particularly the breakdown kind of around tactics techniques and procedures i thought was really really useful um, and also rom-com with the fishing campaign as well and how you were kind of earlier you know about yeah. week or nato i think it was if i remember rightly yeah, but yeah. really tangible examples there yeah i think um you know that knowledge sharing piece is uh is really important um you know we 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 can't really do things in isolation. We are part of an ecosystem of, of effectively, you know, good good people trying to do good things. Um, and you know, there's a there's a lot of stuff that we do do that we we that we don't talk about, and we talk to other vendors about you know things that we uh, that we would expect them to be doing. You know, that supply chain security piece. Um, and I think it's really important that we share when when we can um, what's happening and why it's happening, and give people the intelligence. I, th- I think also it's really it's not really it's, it's you've got to understand the contextual. Like we, I think we just we briefly touched on OT, um, yes. you know, and that as a threat that traditionally has been an environment whereby he, yes, you kind of worried about it, but from a cyber perspective, it was air gapped, it was it was offline, it wasn't connected to anything. Yeah, hey, do you know what that world is changing? You know, we've we've talked about insider threats, we've talked about the the uh, pre- prevalence of, of, of digital technology, which sometimes just unfortunately does enable your air gapped environments without you necessarily knowing it. So having that um, that offline online capability to be as a, a, a effective, whether it's online or offline, is is, is important as anything as well, because um, we may think we're secure because we're offline, um, but fundamentally, um, you know, we, we're not covering all the bases when we talk about things like inside a threat. Now, I think um, BlackBerry as a, as, a, as, a, as an organization has spent a huge amount of time working about with our AI and our, our, on, our, on our AI model about how we can create the same efficacy um, whether we're online or offline, and um, fundamentally we do that with our with our a- a silence uh, technology. Um, so when we're talking to organisations, we're, we're we're considering both their IT and standard sort of IT infrastructure, uh, but we're also talking to them about their OT uh, environments and maybe their manufacturing sites, for example, which are considered to be low risk because they're not connected. We're able to provide the same level of security uh, and assurance that we would do as a connected uh, environment. Superb. I love that. And I think with Silence Guard in particular, it's that around the clock, isn't it, basically, in terms of 24 by 7 by 3, 6, survive. Um, I think brings that all together really, really nicely. It also reflects the evolution of automation that we're seeing in MDR as well. Absolutely. Yeah. The 24 7 is, you know, we, t- we talked about resources. Um, it's that augmentation of your yes. of your of your staff. Um, you know, if you're a small organisation, you're not going to have three or four IT folk just focused on security. You are going to have vulnerabilities and gaps. What the Silence Guard um, brings is the ability to have a twenty four by seven managed security service that allows um, allows you to operate as a business with the security wrapper of BlackBerry protecting your endpoints and your assets. Um, it's an augmentation um, that enables you to, you know, grow your business and, and become uh, productive. You know, spending y- your time on the stuff you're good at, not insecurity. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. And I know we had to bring this to a close. Maybe a final little question. We've, we've already, I love this, we've peppered through lots of examples right throughout our conversation today, but maybe as a final one. Um, again, it can be anonymous if, if necessary too, but are there any final examples of work that you've been doing with, with some of your customers or, or in the industry more broadly, for example, it could be around regulation and AI and a, any of these aspects we've talked about that's really advancing this kind of collective security posture to, 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 to fight the bad guys, so to speak, to use our analogy from earlier but have you got any examples there that where you've been kind of help customers test their defenses around this evolution of threats it's great to just share some examples of kind of the tangible actualization of support in this area yeah i mean um we do a whole bunch of, of stuff sally so whether it's um security uh, maturity assessments compromise assessments red teaming um assessments around your OT and the vulnerabilities within that, maybe whether it's manufacturing or whether you're making planes or whatever it might be, you know, that those assessments are critical with our customers understanding the journey they're on and, and um, how we can help them get there. Um, my personal um, kind of passion, if you like, um, notwithstanding BlackBerry, but as an individual is to, is to have these sorts of conversations uh, with people. Now, um, most people get bored and glaze over after a bit of a period of time. Um, but fundamentally, it's, we've talked about educating and, um, and keeping people informed. Uh, I think these sorts of conversations um, uh, around what is cybersecurity isn't as complex and maybe as uh, uh, certainly a high level than people think. Um, it, it is doing a greater good than maybe some of the stuff we're doing elsewhere. Uh, and, and, I, and I don't mean that facetiously, but, it, you know, if we can upskill everybody in terms of just their common understanding or the common thinking of the way that we go about our daily lives is going to permeate and help every organization um, just by its very nature uh, be more secure. So I think fundamentally, if we can, if we can get people um talking and understanding cybersecurity um, and maybe IT a bit more generally, um, then I think by just by its very nature we'll be we'll be sort of making the making the country and our organizations and our homes more secure. Um, so so for me it's those those personal conversations that um, that we that you have where you know there's kind of a light bulb moment where someone understands what you're talking about yes. and then puts that into action in their daily lives that may then um, help them uh, be more secure. That's that's the thing that really uh, that I, I, I kind of really enjoy. I love that. It really is that facilitation or enablement or empowerment even to, to be more strategic about security, isn't it? And yeah. really with that foundation of education and having conversations for different types of audiences and kind of going where people are, you know, I think that's massively important as well. And having that visibility and really bringing those different factors again around the technology, around culture, around change management, around skills and skills uplift, um, but bringing them together, not treating them as separate entities. You know, I think it's absolutely key and it really brings us three kind of 360 in terms of monitoring defense and and detection really um yeah. without interruption the massively exactly. important bit here as well that i think we need to bring to the fore maybe to close it off today great yeah well sally thanks so much for uh for, for taking the time to, to spend with me today I, it's it's been great talking to you i i really do hope that your uh, your podcast listeners are uh have have, have enjoyed the, the past 30 minutes or so Oh, absolutely. I, we have so many questions around this area and so full of examples here today, Kieran. I think it's fantastic. And we're also as well. So thank you so much to, your, to yourself. I've absolutely loved this conversation. Um, and to all our audience as well, thank you so much for joining us for all your questions too, plus all the different case studies we've mentioned today, lots of research assets and loads of, of, of awareness actually around all things education, even some course opportunities that really link to this area. We'll put all those together. So when this goes live, there'll be lots of assets for you to dive into again and come back and further the conversation and, and understanding so thank you so much Kieran and thank you so much for joining us all today on tomorrow's Tech Today it's been a pleasure thanks for listening to this episode of tomorrow's Tech Today if you enjoy what we're doing please subscribe to us and leave a review it really means a lot you can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram and see more behind the scenes video footage on YouTube thanks for listening